this is a funny thing. I give about 10 dozen different talks that I have when somebody calls and wants me to do a lecture, they don't know what they want. I send them a list and usually that's what I have to do because my time to develop new lectures is pretty limited. And this one is just terribly popular. <laughs> I've given it and I've improved it a little bit. I've added some things to it. So by way of disclaimer to make sure you're paying attention, on your handout there are actually some things that you will see that are not on there. I apologize for that but it's, it's you can take quick notes or you can contact me later if you want the uh, revised handout electronically. Um, but I keep adding to this. At some point it's going to be a two or three hour lecture but we, we get to look at pretty flowers. So we'll start with hydrangeas and you know hydrangeas are one of those things that everybody got for Easter or Mother's Day and then they were in the pot and you planted it and if the winter was mild it would bloom again. If your soils were acidic it would stay blue. If it wasn't it would be kind of a muddy pink, can't decide if it's blue, fuchsia, purple, whatever color. Um, they weren't all that popular. They were something that was more used in pots throughout most of the country. Um, and the reason for that is because of their finicky nature in terms of what happens if the winter buds are killed. Um, those overwintering buds generally have the flowers already in them. So if they're killed, we don't get any flowers. That's still the case for your florist hydrangeas. I know every year I help the um, the altar guild at my church and they get hydrangeas and they want to plant them in the grounds of the church and I say, no, you don't want to plant those hydrangeas. There are others. So I've helped them by planting some others. Some of them will mention today because I don't have enough room in my own yard to plant all the hydrangeas. I test them at my church. Um, so we want hydrangeas that flower even if the overwintering buds are killed. We want attractive senest flowers. What is a senest flower? It's a flower that's done its thing. A lot of times senesce flowers turn brown and not very attractive colors. But sometimes, and you'll see this here, the senesce flowers in some ways can sometimes be almost if not more attractive than the flowers when they're doing their thing. Foliage interest. Yeah, when these things are not in flower, we have our foliage. You're going to see some unusual things with foliage today. Greater tolerance to heat and drought. I always tell people you need to plant a hydrangea because it's going to be your indicator plant in your garden for when you need to water. That will be the first thing to wilt. <laughs> when it's wilted you know you need to water. Um, hardiness of course, that's not so much an issue for you here but um, for, I think it still can be an issue because you too have been subject to some of these second half of March very cold snaps. And that can actually, even though your climate here, or our climate here is fairly warm, those late cold episodes can really do a lot of damage. So ironically as, as climate changes we need to have plants that are hardier because they tend to start up, their, they start growing and coming out of dormancy earlier. And so we need to have them hardier because they may be coming out of dormancy in early March and then we get 20 degrees. <laughs> and we all know what happens there. Smaller size, people have generally have smaller yards so we need plants that are smaller to fit that scale. And of course, nothing of concern to you but to the industry, ease of propagation. We can have great wonderful plants and if you can't root cuttings, it's not going to be commercially viable or it's going to be very expensive. That's one reason, um, if you know paper bark maple, you know that tree? That's one reason it's very expensive because it doesn't really propagate from seed very well and about 2% of the cuttings will root. So you have to take a lot of cuttings and it's slow growing too. So that's what we need in a hydrangea. Um, first of all we have to have a little botanical um, education here going on. Here we have the inflorescence of a hydrangea, this whole thing, usually dome shaped or conical in shape. It's called a panicle. It's just a branched inflorescence. And then around the outside, generally speaking, we have sterile florets. What does that mean? They're sterile. What do they lack? 
They lack pollen. They also lack the female parts. Then what use are they? What's a flower without stamens and pistils and pollen? Hydrangeas just fake out pollinators. They produce sterile florets because it's less effort than making all the flowers pretty. Um, you kind of see the same thing in composite flowers like chrysanthemum or daisies. That, that whole, what we call a flower is an inflorescence and outside we have ray florets that have one petal that sticks out. All those yellow things in the middle are individual flowers, but they lack petals. So it's uh, thought to be a, a more highly evolved strategy where you aren't putting as much energy into flowers. Um, so we have, right here we have those fertile florets. I see only one of them open here. I'll try using this. This is, you can see it right there. Most of these are closed. When they do open, you won't see much petal. They're little rudimentary petals, but you'll see the stamens and the pistils. This is where the seed will come from in a hydrangea. And then if you look at these, there's nothing in them, but they have big petals that are colorful. So your word for the day, and I'm not going to do, how many of you watched Pee Wee Herman? You might have children or grandchildren. Um, I remember he had the word for the day and everybody had to scream when they heard the word for the day. Please don't do that. Uh, <laughs> um, the word for the day is remontant. And you have, I'm not going to ask if you know what that means. It's a fancy word. All it means is that it will bloom again on new wood. A good example is our roses. How many of you know that roses naturally are not remontant except for one species? Rosa chinensis. Guess which species is in all of our hybrids? Yeah. Rosa chinensis. Guess which, guess which species really has, doesn't have much resistance to black spot? Rosa chinensis. <laughs> <laughs> That's why our roses tend to get black spot. Um, but remontant means that it's flowering again, flowering sporadically from new growth. And keyword there is sporadically. Um, these things that are remontant aren't necessarily going to bloom with the same exuberance that they do early in the season in the spring, but they will continue. If they have enough moisture and nutrients and light, they will continue to flower as time goes on. Um, that's as opposed to non-remontant hydrangeas or plants that just have their buds formed in late in the fall in the buds or their flowers formed in the buds late in the fall. So those buds are there. All they have to do is expand. Once they've expanded and bloomed, they're done for the season. So generally people want remontant flowering things for two reasons. One is you get a longer season of bloom and the other is that if we do have buds killed in a bitter winter, you can still get that plant blooming that year. Now we also have to do a little with taxonomy. Um, this is extra important with hydrangeas and somewhat important with uh, magnolias too because things have gotten very confused. Of course we have the genus and I'm going to use magnolia as an example. We get to those second half of the talk. Um, and then that's always capitalized in italics. And then we have the species name which is Virginiana in this example, meaning from Virginia, although it has a much wider range. That's never capitalized. And then we have the variety. This is variety australis and that's abbreviated VAR period, not italicized, but the word australis is meaning the southern form of the Virginia magnolia. Um, that's a naturally occurring subset of the species that has some characteristic that's different. And then you have the cultivar name. Unless you were, use the word cultivar in a sentence, you have to have the single quotes. Um, in this case, it's Perry Page. That happens to be the person in Tennessee who found this particular magnolia in his seedling block. He's a nurseryman. And then you have the trade name. Trade name are very important with hydrangeas. Anytime you see a trade name, it's sort of an indicator that there's money to be made. <laughs> because the trade name, as far as, you know, the trade names, taxonomous botanists hate them because they have nothing to do with botany, taxonomy, or anything official for the plant. 
All that a trade name or a trademark when you see that is, it's a license name under which that plant is sold. That's all it is. So I can sell that plant without that name, technically, and not have to worry about putting trademark or anything with that. So um, to scientists, we generally put those in small caps. Um, you'll see that this way throughout the um, talk. There's a lot of confusion because people think that's the cultivar, but it's actually not the cultivar name, the official cultivar name. It's just a sales name, if you will. So our old hydrangeas, we have some wonderful ones. Um, I guess coming from South Dakota, I remember, and this is the one that I always associate with Chincoteague because most yards have old hydrangeas in them. They do very well there. And a lot of them, I would guess, are Nico Blue. And you can see just a wonderful, deep azure color um, as long as it's grown on acidic soil. So what can you do if you want blue in your hydrangeas and you don't have acidic soil? You can add iron sulfate. The old wisdom was you can add aluminum sulfate or iron sulfate. Uh, iron sulfate. Um, Keep in mind that aluminum sulfate, aluminum can be toxic to some extent. Iron sulfate is a much better way to go. Iron sulfate will work no matter what. You hear some people say, well, you can add sulfur, just uh, you know, powdered sulfur. That will only work on soils if your pH is already below 6.2 because that requires microbial activity to produce sulfates that will then bring the pH down. So if you, yeah, the safe thing is always to use iron sulfate. How much? It depends on your soil test. But, you know, I think a half cup or a cup scattered around a plant in the root zone um, is going to do that for many years probably. Generally speaking, our soils are acidic. So this is not something that we run into. Unless you're dealing with a lot of construction debris, there might be a lot of lime in a part of your soil that might be a very high pH. Okay, so the first hydrangea that really arrived on the scenes about 20 years ago that really changed everything was this one. Um, this is Balmer. Again, these cultivar names, when they market them under a trademark name, the cultivar names don't really, aren't that attractive. Um, but this is Endless Summer. They're now calling it Endless Summer, the original. This is from Bailey Nurseries. And Mike Durr, if you know his Woody Plant book, was visiting Bailey and saw a block of plants that they had had for a long time that were blooming in midsummer and asked what the deal was. Oh, that's just a weird hydrangea that blooms on new wood. We can't get it to grow very tall, so we don't market it. Um, <laughs> well, he convinced them to market it. And Endless Summer was marketed with great abandon. Um, and you don't see it that much anymore because there are others like it that have appeared on the scene. But it was the first remontant flowering one. And actually, it had first been noted, I think, back in the 1920s or something. So it was around, or Bailey had it in their nurseries, as, but they just weren't really marketing it. This is not on your uh, list. This is a new development amongst the endless summer. If you don't like blue, and you got to have that dark pink, you can have the dark pink. Now, I put this in too to illustrate a point, and that is that with the dark pinks, if they're pink to begin with, you can put all the iron sulfate you want, and you're not going to get blue. Okay. The base color pigment in the petals on this is reddish. So if you acidify, what are you going to get? Purple. So if you really like purple, you could go ahead and use the iron sulfate there. Um, this one I have not grown. I will try to note, I've grown most of these myself, so I have some personal experience. I don't believe in talking too much about a plant until I've grown it or tried to kill it myself. Uh, <laughs> and I've killed many. Um, this one is new. I have not grown it, but it's shorter in stature than all the other endless summers. It's said to be more heat and drought tolerant. So it would be interesting to try that and see if that's true. Although if we have a year like we did last year, drop tolerant is not such a thing. Um, flooding saturation tolerant is more of a thing. 
I haven't grown that one, but they're saying that like 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches. Yeah, so it's more spreading apparently. I'm skeptical. You know, they can be that size, but if they continue to grow, um, you know, you want to be careful with that. I have a twist and shout that I planted at the church that was supposed to be three feet, and it's six, seven feet now. So it likes where it is, and it's okay for it to be that size. Um, this is, I don't believe this is on your list either. But I had to add it because I had an experience with this plant just last year. Um, you see the cultivar name there, P-I-I-H-M-2, um, Endless Summer Bloomstruck. This, if you look it up on Google, you will see that it's hydrangea um, um, macrophylla. It's not really. I have inside information from the folks at Bailey's that it's a complex hybrid. It has some other species in it. It's really an interesting hydrangea because it does have the nice blue foliage. It's very floriferous. And what's really nice about it is that the florets, I don't have a good image of it, but the florets fade to kind of a blue color. So this looks like it's in bloom for a long time. Um, this plant, I, I don't know what kind of mood I was in, but I tried to abuse it to death last year. I got a free plant at a program at the Arboretum last spring, and I just left it in the pot on the deck. Watered it when it got wilted, <laughs> you know. And that thing just bloomed like crazy. I stuck it in the garage over the winter and maybe watered it a couple of times. And it's just full of flower buds now. I actually gave it to a friend. But if you want to do hydrangeas in a pot, this is one that I'd highly recommend if you're a deck gardener. Because it tolerates pot culture very, very well. And not all hydrangeas do. Uh, this is Twist and Shout. If you don't like the formal, big, blousy, what we call mop head hydrangeas that don't have any fertile florets. They're all sterile. If you look in there, deep in the inflorescence, there will always be a few fertile florets. But the mop heads have more sterile florets than just the ring around the outside of the panicle. This is more traditional, more like nature intended, where we have the sterile florets and then the uh, fertile florets in the middle. This is Twist and Shout. It's a pretty tall hydrangea. <laughs> As I said, I don't know what the company, what Bailey's is saying it grows to, but um, I've found it to grow to six feet pretty easily after a long period of time. But a nice pink color, nice airy, kind of more informal look than some of the mop head hydrangeas. We'll go to some others. Um, this is Let's Dance Big Easy. Um, I have not grown this one myself, but I put it in here because I think there's been a lot of interest in the two-tone hydrangeas. This one is remontant as well. I will tell you if something is not remontant. Let's put it that way. Everything else in here is going to bloom on new wood as well as old wood. Um, this is a novelty. This has huge florette. Yes, that is not an infant's hand. That is a person's hand. Um, this is Let's Dance Diva, and it's got all, it's got a lot of uh, uh, sterile florets that are very large. I planted this, and it just hasn't done well. I have, that's just one plant, though, and I haven't coddled it or anything, but it hasn't grown well. And my theory is that when something has florets this huge, it's got some inbreeding depression or something going on, because it's just not very vigorous. But if you want the largest hydrangea flowers on the block, um, this is one that I would try. <clears throat> As I said before, a lot of interest, and this is a good example of it. We're interested in what happens to those florets after the flowering period is over. Because there you see it in flower. It's a nice, you know, maybe lavender blue hydrangea. But wow, look at what happens to it when those flowers age out. Because you get this nice picotty of red developing as the interior part of the florets turn green. And somebody's going to ask me, will it dry that color? It could. Some of them do dry with pretty good retention of color. Others do not. Um, keep in mind that even if they dry with that color, over time, with exposure to light, those are going to, the pigments are going to bleach out, and you're going to end up with tan. But that's pretty, too, in indoor arrangements. Um, this is another one uh, from um, Plants Nouveau. 
Um, you don't see this out too much, but I love that color. I love that greenish, light blue color together. Um, and it looks like it's a very uh, dwarf one as well. I have not grown this myself. Again, I threw it in because I know Plants Nouveau has some very good plants out there. And again, that interest in how they look after the flowering is finished, when you still have the florets there. And then you have the Yumi Passion series. There you see the same thing. And you see how dependent that is on pH. We have it on, the pink is in alkaline soil and the blue is in acidic soil. So you can manipulate things to be the way that you want them to be. What I would say is try to avoid pH 7 because then you get the hydrangea that can't decide what color it wants to be. It'll be kind of the muddy in between blue and pink. Um, this is notable because the florets on it have extra petals, so they're double. And City, City Line Mars, this is actually um, its appearance when it's in bloom. A lot of these have been bred in Europe, so they may not be as hardy, but again, they are Remontant bloomers for us. Generally speaking, the ones in um, like Remars that were bred in Europe do not tolerate heat and humid heat and drought as well as some of the others. But they're nice flowers. So we move on from the florist hydrangea, hydrangea macrophylla, to hydrangea arborescence, which is one of our native species. You can find this in the southeast. Um, and one of the things that took the country by storm was Invincible Spirit. How many people are growing Invincible Spirit? Just three of us? What do you think about it? I love it. You love it. How about you? Somebody back there. I'm not even sure. <laughs> You're not sure? Okay. Um, this plant was marketed heavily, and as a garden writer, I get a lot of free plants, or I used to. I think. Some of the companies got frustrated with me because I didn't write about their plants all that often. Um, in a, my, a lot of my column is based on pest and disease issues. So I don't get plants that often anymore for free shipped to me, which is probably a good thing because if you saw my yard, it's a lot of one of this, one of that, and it's just kind of a mess. And I'm trying to get away from that. But I swear I got this plant given to me eight times. <laughs> and Initially, I was very disappointed in it because it really, the first two or three years, for me, it didn't do much. It was underwhelming. But then it finds its stride, and now it's really been a pretty good one. I've, I've actually got rid of some of them because they take up quite a bit of space. But it is one that I do like now. Um, it's a lot like the old Annabelle. If, have, has anybody grown Annabelle? That's a more common one, except it's pink. Um, and the nice thing about any of the arborescence is you can cut it back to the ground every year. They really don't care. And they will bloom nicely for you. Actually, they'll bloom better for you. You get larger florets if you cut them back. So we'll have a little more on pruning because I know you're going to get, that's your number one question. How do I prune my hydrangeas? Um, we'll have a whole slide devoted to that. And then we have Aspra, which is a uh, Japanese species that you don't see very often. I think Aspera is actually in one of the, has some parentage into Bloomstruck as well. Um, but you won't see that on the internet. That's sort of a little secret. Um, this is Plum Passion, not named for its flowers, which here you can see that um, even the, we can look here and see that the fertile florets, which are open here, are bluish. Well, the sterile florets are pink. Yeah, they don't have to be the same color. Um, but the flowering on this is not anything to write home about. This one was selected for its foliage because it has purplish foliage, almost black in certain conditions. And then in the autumn, you get some nice fall color. We don't think of hydrangeas at all for fall color. Um, if they turn color, it's maybe yellow or yellowy green before the leaves drop. Um, but this one has very good fall color. I have not grown it. Has anybody grown this one? I gave a talk that somebody else was very happy with, with it in this area. But I threw it in here because the different species, if you want something with fall color and with foliage interest all year round, if you don't care too much about the flowers, I didn't think the flowers are spectacular, but 
this would be a good choice for you. And then we have the PG hydrangeas, which are how they got that name. It's not Prince George's County. Um, it's <laughs> that's what we think of when we hear PG in, in, these, in this part of the world. But it's hydrangea paniculata grandiflora. So the PG is paniculata grandiflora. Um, or tree hydrangea. These were plants that really fell out of favor. They were once very popular in the 50s and 60s, but then you really didn't see them much after that. They kind of got a reputation as <coughs> kind of big, obnoxious flowers, a coarse textured shrub. If you read Durr's early work on it, he doesn't have much good to say about it. But what's amazing with this, and I, I contend this is with any plant that's fallen out of fa favor, if you manipulate it in certain ways, it can become immensely popular again. And this is a good case of that. Um, this is Pinky Winky, which is, I love that name. Um, one of my favorites, um, this is a largest shrub. It will grow to six or seven feet. But it really does have pink lower florets. Now it's a paniculata grandiflora, so all the paniculatas have these cone-shaped florets rather than, or flowers, inflorescences rather than the dome shape. So the bottom is kind of that strawberry, it starts out as pink and turns more strawberry red as time goes by. Um, somebody was lamenting earlier that they can't grow hydrangeas and magnolias because they got too much sun. You can grow this one in full sun and it's just fine. Um, it will not wilt like your other hydrangeas. The key thing with most paniculata type hydrangeas is to cut them back hard periodically. They will grow, yeah, it's called a tree hydrangea, and I have seen small specimens that are like 12 feet that have been trained as a tree. I've never seen one that was attractive. <laughs> so I, I remember one of the homes that I moved to had a whole row of these that had been kind of let go. I cut them back to maybe two or three feet. And that year I had stems like this with heads of flowers that were probably two feet by two feet. You know, it, they're just huge heads of flowers. Um, so they will really respond well to pruning and producing um, much bigger heads of flowers. So these used to have the ball on them? Yes. Yeah. These bloom on new wood. So these, you would want to do that hacking operation in the fall or early enough in the spring before things start to leaf out. And they will, they will break buds on naked stems. They don't, you know, you don't have to prune back to a bud. I prune back to sticks. <laughs> um, this is another one that's really nice, uh, vanilla strawberry. And this is one that I planted too. Um, I think the idea behind this one was something a little smaller which, with the little smaller florets. It's called quick fire because it blooms very rapidly or the shrub develops very rapidly and can bloom very quickly. Um, I will say I've got it in a really horrible place and it's done very well. This is a tough plant and it stays rather small, which is kind of a plus for paniculatus because they get big. But, yeah. Yeah, but I haven't pruned it. So, I mean, you would think that eventually it, would, it, it could be. I've probably stunted it somewhat. It's next to the garage. I, I only see it from time to time, <laughs> and it's still there. If you need something really small, I have not grown this, but this is Bobo, and that's going to get about two feet um, if you need a tiny paniculata. I haven't seen that much in the mar on the market, so I'm skeptical about how, how well it do really does. Sometimes these really dwarf things can lack vigor and not really survive well in our gardens. But it's an interesting thing to try if you get a chance to. Have you, has somebody grown it? Okay. And it's staying small for you, for Ginny. Good. <laughs> now the deer will eat my paniculatas, but I look at that as they're doing a little bit of free pruning for me because I'm a lazy gardener. Um, as long as they don't do too much. I want to take a little aside because the, I have to tout our U.S. Nat National Arboretum introductions. Um, we had a great breeding program um, in our McMinnville, Tennessee location. 
working with hydrangea quercifolia, which is one of our wonderful native hydrangeas. Anybody growing quercifolia type hydrangeas? If you aren't, you should. They're so easy and they have so many wonderful attributes. Um, but um, the breeder that worked on these, uh, she approached it looking for a solution to a foliar disease problem. Uh, normally we don't get that, but I saw it last year with all the rain that we had, and it can make them look pretty ugly. So she started with Sykes dwarf and some other dwarf types and started breeding. And this is ruby slippers, which has been immensely popular for good reason. Um, again, this is white, but it's kind of boring when it's in bloom. This is after flowering. It will turn this lovely pinky shade and that retains that pink color from the time it finishes flowering, which is going to be um, May, late May, and it'll retain that color all the way through August usually. So a lot of good impact in the garden, and it's small. This, by the way, is Don Shadow, if you've ever heard of Shadow Nurseries. He's sort of Mr. Dogwood in Tennessee. And he interestingly also has a zoo in his nursery. He collects animals as well. Wonderful thing about most of the oak leaf hydrangeas is what they do in the autumn. Wonderful fall color, burgundies and reds. I've seen just the brightest scarlet red on some of these. Very lovely in the fall. And even when they're, um, if they're not flowering much, the leaves are oak shaped and very interesting texture in the landscape. One that's a little bit taller than ruby slippers is munchkin. Again, this is a dwarf. And yes, our scientists named these after Wizard of Oz characters. <laughs> I'm glad we don't have one named Wicked Witch of the West. Um, but the, the breeding program is, um, has ended. She re Sandy Reed retired. So, um, But Munchkin is just a little bit uh, bigger, and it has longer florets that turn, instead of a pink red, it's more of a mahogany red, deeper red, after they've matured, when they've senesced. Um, they will tell, Munchkin gets to about two and a half feet, three feet, where Ruby Slippers is more like two feet. And then if you want something bigger that's lighter pink when the florets turn from white to pink, try Queen of Hearts. This will get to four feet, four or five feet. Very broad leaves too, so it's a little coarser texture than Ruby Slippers or Munchkin. So those are the three arboretum introductions. About pruning, if you pay attention to nothing else today, this is one that I'm sure that in your plant clinics and helping your neighbors, everybody's going to ask you, how do I prune that hydrangea? It depends on the hydrangea. It's just like clematis. It depends on which one you're talking about. If it's an arborescence, if it's Annabelle or Invincible spirit, um, you cut those back to six inches annually. I just did that when I did my spring garden cleanup. The thing's already growing very vigorously. And at the top of each of those new stems, you will have a new inflorescence that's pretty large. If you don't prune, they get really twiggy, and they make itty bitty little inflorescences that just look kind of messy and not as many of them. So you do want to prune this annually, or at least biannually, if you don't get around to it. Hydrangea paniculata, you want to cut back, maybe not quite as far, maybe to one to two feet, every five years or so. Okay, you wouldn't want to cut them back every year necessarily, but every five years or so. And then the others, you really don't need to do that much pruning. Um, if you want to, you can cut them back, cut the longest canes back to reduce the size, improve vigor. You can do that about every five to ten years, um, and that's the quercifolias and the macrophyllas. But we've had like ruby slippers and munchkin for ten years, and we've never pruned them, and they look just fine. Can't see that they're going to need pruning uh, anytime soon. So let's move on to magnolias. Yes. Limelight is a paniculata, so you would want to uh, do that every five years or so. Cut it back to one to two feet. If you don't, it'll continue to grow, but, but the flowers will get smaller. It'll get kind of trunky and won't look as good, in my opinion. Um, yes? Is there any set here? I've moved to a new property, and I've got hydrangeas 
no flowers. Is there a way of looking at the plant itself to determine which of those it is? If you have no flowers on your hydrangea, I would be willing to bet you that it's a macrophylla. And it's probably one of those florist, is it, is it a very old plant? Yes. It's probably one of those florist varieties that really is very, um, the flowers inside the buds are very frost tender. So that 90% of the time, if a hydrangea is not blooming, that's what's going on. Does it have, do the tips of the branches die usually during the winter? Do the tips of the branches tend to die during the winter? Well, we bought the house, they cut everything back, so I'm waiting for growth. Oh, okay, okay. So when did, when was it cut? Well, they're macrophyllas, so that the macrophyllas have large leaves that are glossy, and they are sort of heart-shaped. Yeah. It may be if it was cut back recently that it may bloom later. later. Yeah. Yes. What was the name of the one set in a container? That was Bloomstruck. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's a pretty new one, but it's a good one. Yes, Lois. Yes. That would be the best time to do that. Just like you would a lilac or a forsythia, you want to get in there and take the oldest, because what tends to happen with some of them is the really old canes g get twiggy and kind of lose vigor. Like any shrub, that's called renewal pruning. If you prune those old, really thick stems out, you'll get a lot of nice, vigorous growth coming out after that. And that will result in more flowers the following season. The only other thing that will cause your hydrangea not to bloom is not enough sunlight. <laughs> yeah, they say quercifolia. All hydrangeas need sunlight to some extent. Um, you get the native ones like quercifolia that they say will tolerate some shade. And yeah, they'll tolerate some shade like two or three hours. But if you plant it under your beech tree, if you can actually dig a hole under your beech tree to plant it, I can guarantee you that quercifolia is not going to bloom much. You might get one flower on the whole thing, but they do need some sun. So hydrangeas for shade, not really. Um, what's great for them is afternoon shade, because then you'll avert some of the wilting problem, particularly with the macrophylla types, the mop head type hydrangeas. Yes? So if you're going to remove the oldest canes, does it matter what time of year you do that? You'll want to do it right after flowering, because then everything that grows is going to grow nicely, and then in the autumn, late summer, you're going to get the buds forming uh, with the flowers inside of them. Yeah. How much time when you say a lot of summer? An hour a day? Or? Um, uh, six hours. At least four or five hours to get good flowering on them. Yeah. Uh, the grandiflores really like to be in full sun. They'll tolerate a tiny bit of shade. Um, arborescence will tolerate a tiny little bit of shade, but again, the more shade you have, the less flowers you're going to have, and you know, why are we growing these things? So, Okay, magnolias. Um, a few things that we're looking for in magnolias that are a little different than hydrangeas. Our deciduous magnolias bloom early in the season. Some bloom as early as February for us at the Arboretum sometimes. So we're concerned about later blooming or frost-tolerant flowers. Why? Have you ever had your saucer magnolia freeze after it flowered? There are a few things that look worse in the landscape. It can go from looking absolutely stunningly beautiful, and then overnight you wish it wasn't there. Because <laughs> you have these just very sad-looking brown, it looks like small banana peels hanging from all over the tree. Um, of course, we want sizes and shapes that, uh, shapes that fit into small landscapes always because people, that's been a trend. People have uh, less uh, land in their landscape. Greater variety of flowers, colors, and shapes. We're never satisfied with same old, same old pink and white, are we? You know, we have to have something different. You're going to see some different things today. Unusual and extended bloom periods, of course. You know, we, one of my I don't have a lot of azaleas in my garden because 
for me, they bloom very quickly. And this year, they were very quick. You know, they're already starting to uh, go by for us. And then you have the whole year to wait. And they're, they're nice evergreen shrubs. Um, the deer eat them too, so that's another reason I don't rely on them heavily in my garden because if they're eating them in the winter, they're eating the flower buds. <laughs> so, so I can't get them to bloom very often. But we want unusual and extended bloom periods on our plants. Foliage color and texture. It's always important because when that plant's not in bloom, what does it look like? Attractive buds are something I've used. Um, anybody look carefully at the saucer magnolia buds or even the um, star magnolia buds? I've used those very effectively in holiday arrangements because they're so cute and fuzzy. Um, by the way, um, a lot our deciduous magnolias work very well in floral design. You just have to pick them just when they're showing color and open them uh, in floral preserve solution. I'm surprised that some enterprising florist hasn't, uh, or, or grower, hasn't started growing them as a specialty crop. But we've used them heavily at times for uh, uh, arrangements. And then we have hardiness and heat tolerance, of course, always. And finally, ease of propagation for our friends, the nurserymen. They're not going to grow it if it's difficult to pro propagate just because of money. So we have to do our little tutorial on this whole thing. The flower structure of magnolias is very interesting. It's actually very simple and very, not very evolved. If you look at this thing, we have the tepals. And what is a tepal? A tepal is sort of like a petal, but it's not a petal because on flowers that have sepals and petals, they're similar structures, but sepals are green and petals are colored. And this one, there are no, um, there are only petal-like things. There are no sepals, so they're all called tepals, okay? Which, there are some clues here about the ancient origins of magnolias. That's one of them. They aren't highly evolved enough to have a green leafy structure that subtends the colorful petal. It's just a petal. Um, and then on the interior, we have a cone-like thing that has um, both the petals, or both the uh, stamens and the anthers in it, packed very tightly. And cone-like is a clue here, because these are one of the closest relatives to our conifers. Magnolias were some of the first um, flowering plants on the planet, and they have survived this long. And then you even see that when that seed pod matures, it actually has these arils, or fleshy things that have the seed inside of them. And they come out of the cone scales like that. So they're very much like a conifer. Very ancient origins. This is Denudata. This is one of the earliest ones for us. Sometimes end of February, this is in bloom. Um, it does have somewhat frost hardy flowers, so if we have a few degrees of frost, it will still be okay. But if we get down to 20, it looks pretty bad. But if you want a really early magnolia, um, this would be one to check out. Then we have to plug our girl magnolias. I've, I've often wondered, would we get away with calling these girl magnolias this day and age? Things have changed since the 1950s and 1960s. Um, we would call them the little women or feminist leader magnolias or something like that. <laughs> We'd find a way. Um, they're nice because they bloom about 10 days later than our saucer magnolias. Um, and why is that so important? Because statistically, they're going to miss that many frost events, many more frost events. It's very, I've seen it happen that they get nailed, but it's very unusual for them to get hit by frost. Also, they're small. We have some that are really old trees that get to about 15 feet in height. So if you have limited space, you don't want a big, huge um, Magnolia X Solangiana, the, the tulip tree magnolia or saucer magnolia, this would be one for you. And I think the colors are a little nicer too. They're a little bit more saturated. Just a few of them. Jane is one of the bigger of the girls. 
kind of pinky on the inside, a uh, little bit more of a dark pink or even a little bit of purple working into the reverse side of the tepal. And then interestingly, we have in our Magnolia collection, we have one called Verbanica, which is an old cultivar. That's just a saucer magnolia. We noticed, or one of our staff noticed this mess in the tree. It's actually a witch's broom where that spontaneously started to branch a lot. We've propagated that. You see one of the propagations there blooming at a very young age. That plant's about 18 inches tall. And it's already got six or seven flowers on it. And there you see them, this is a couple of years ago. They've gotten to maybe six feet after 10 years. Um, but there is a shrubby <laughs> um, sort of dwarf magnolia on the horizon. We've got this out to the industry for evaluation. And if they can propagate it successfully, propagation has been an issue with this. It's not the easiest thing to propagate. Um, so if it can be propagated successfully, you may see it on the marketplace. Galaxy is an old one that, that we were introduced, I think, in the 1960s. It's still one of the best, in my opinion. If you're going to plant a deciduous magnolia, Galaxy is wonderful. Again, it's later, like the girls. It has a very nice pyramidal habit, too. So it can be somewhat formal in the landscape. They're tough. I always tell people, you shouldn't be planting Bradford pear. You should plant Galaxy magnolias. They're not invasive. They don't stink when, they, when they're in bloom. Um, and they don't break up <laughs> in ice storms the way Bradford pears do. Nice, big, deep pink flowers. This one is orchid. Some of the uh, magnolias have narrower tepals, and that can kind of give an interesting appearance to them. Some have broader. This is Vulcan, one of my favorites. This is not, this is one that would actually like a little bit cooler climate, so if you're going to try Vulcan, try to go for a, a, a cooler microclimate. Maybe you're lucky enough to live on the water where you sometimes get those bay breezes and it isn't hot as Hades as it is for those of us who are in Washington all the time. Um, although I know it gets hot out here too. Um, and then Magnolia denudata is another very early one. Very nice. I, I kind of like this one because it doesn't have the dusty color. It's got more of a pink and white aspect to it cleaner color. And then the new things in magnolias. For years, well back, you know, dating back to the 1600s, our botanists knew about a funny tree in our woodland called the cucumber tree. So named because the fruits look something like a cucumber before the arils pop out. They're green and they're elongated. And oddly enough, there are two types. Um, Subspecies chordata that you see above there has tepals that are yellow. And then you have the straight species that looks like it maybe thought that it should try to be a tulip poplar or something. And tulip poplar actually is in the magnolia family. So I'm, you know, with genetic uh, uh, insertion and stuff, maybe someday we'll have some of that germplasm worked into magnolia with weird leaf shapes and things like that. But um, this was a source of yellow in our deciduous magnolias. So hence when we, we uh, got that hybridized with Solangiana, we got Elizabeth, which is a nice light yellow pyramidal form. Because um, the cucumber tree blooms quite a bit later, these yellow forms are really pretty late. So they usually escape frost. Ivory chalice has just a touch of yellow. That's kind of an attractive color. Very large flowers on that as well. That's in our collections. And then one of my favorites um, is Daybreak. There's another one similar to this called Judy Zook that are these peace rose colors of yellow um, or pink suffused with yellow. And then Hot Flash. Um, we also have Yellow Fever, you know, these uh, I wouldn't consider these hot colors in the garden because they're soft yellow. They're not like forsythia. And if you get me alone somewhere, you'll find out very quickly I don't really like forsythia because I don't like that color yellow. But this is a great color yellow. It's softer. It fits better in the spring landscape, in my opinion. The worst thing you can do, in my opinion, it, by the way, is plant a bunch of forsythia with your saucer magnolia and get that nice clash of that harsh yellow 
with that dusty pink. Um, but you see that all the time. It's just not me. And then we have Sunray, which is a large one with a little bit uh, uh, lighter yellow um, teeples as well. And Yellow Fever, we, this has done very well for us. We actually planted this in horrible conditions in our flowering tree walk, and I've been very pleased with it. It hasn't grown very fast, but it has held its own in very difficult, rotten, rotten soil. Some of our native magnolias are wonderful. If you're looking for that tropical effect, you should try mag Magnolia macro macrophylla. We have Hydrangea macrophylla, so we have to move to Magnolia macrophylla in this talk, too. Um, so named, guess why it's macrophylla? Huge leaves. I mean, we're talking three or four feet long on some of these. So if you want something that looks really tropical, and yes, it is deciduous, so it'll kind of look like sticks during the winter, but it is wonderful in the summer landscape, even if it isn't in flower. Uh, but the flowers are spectacular, too. They're pure white, and they have those lovely purple brush strokes in the inside teeples. No, I'm glad that you, um, bees are high, more highly evolved insects. Um, another clue to the ancient origins of magnolias is that for the most part, they're pollinated by beetles. Beetles. So they have, yeah, you would think even like the southern magnolia is very sweetly fragrant, but that fragrance is actually more attractive to beetles than it is to honeybees. Sometimes you do see bees working magnolias, but um, bees are more typically, or beetles are more typically, and some species of fly are more typically the uh, uh, pollinators. If you have a small garden, I know I've got five minutes. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, if you have a small garden that's shady, this would be a good choice. This is what I call the egg magnolia because the flowers hang down and when they're, before they're open, they look like eggs. And if you look up in them, you get this wonderful uh, pinkish red stamens, and they're fragrant. Um, Magnolia grandiflora, moving into our evergreen southern magnolias. The dwarf ones have been all the rage. Um, some of them I do not recommend because they do not age well. Little Jim is one that looks wonderful in the nursery, but it does not age well. For some reason, it gets all these water sprouts as it matures. It doesn't look good. But Alta has done very well for us. It's sort of like an improved dwarf uh, southern magnolia. Good for a tall hedge if you need a tall hedge as well. And then the final one that I have here is that one that we used for the lesson. This is Perry Page. This is a Magnolia virginiana, which are wonderful trees. Um, some of them are, they can't decide if they're going to be deciduous or evergreen, but generally they're somewhat deciduous for us. This is a shrubby one that gets to maybe six or seven feet. What's nice about this is because of its size, you really get to smell the flowers. And anybody have a Magnolia virginiana? The flowers are wonderful, wonderfully fragrant, and they're good in flower arrangements as well. Well, I did finish on time. I didn't think I was going to. I, I challenged myself because I added those plants and was going to see if I could fit it in. Um, do we have time for any questions? Yes. I did that just as a, a mean, dirty trick to you. No, <laughs> it wasn't my fault. How does the Sibaldi work? You didn't say how it, it, it responds to your planting. How it what? How it responds to your planting, whether it was success or not success. Oh, Sibaldi is fine. It needs a little bit of shade. Magnolia Sibaldii needs a little shade more than the other magnolias, uh, which makes it kind of nice for a woodland garden. And it's kind of vase-shaped and small, maybe 15 feet. Plant it somewhere like close to a path or something where you can look up into the flowers. And they're fragrant as well. Yes, the back. So um, I just moved to a place in Tulloch County that has so-called soil. It's really like a green place. <laughs> Wonderful. I have that, too. Okay, so, um, <laughs> is there any chance that I could grow some of these? 
Yes, um, actually you're in the Magnolia virginiana, Magnolia grandiflora would do just fine. Your deciduous types, not so much. Um, as far as hydrangeas, uh, that's not a great environment for them. They really, all of them do need some good drainage. Yeah, use, use the bloom struck in a container. Or, you know, with the hydrangeas, they like a high water table. I would look at, you can have wonderful ones where you are in a raised bed because they will draw on that moisture that's retained in that kind of soil. I too have that problem. I looked up my soil classification in my backyard and found out it was, it very specifically said uh, water table seasonally within four inches of the soil surface. Let me tell you something, the last, this last year, and as we speak now, it's not at the soil surface, it's above the soil surface, and it's running. <laughs> I think I'm gonna grow rice instead of lawn. Yes? That, that was my question about hydrangeas and the high water table. Yep. That's what I have, yep. I have full sun. High water table is actually good for them okay. if you can get them in some loose, airy soil on top of that, because that's why they grow well in Chincoteague. You know, you go there, the water table's very high, sandy soil. I've never seen them drought stress there. Now they do get cooling breezes dur sometimes during the summer, but they're constantly, they have a constant source of water and they do beautifully in that situation. Oh, thank you. I drink macrophylla that you prune only the old right. uh, canes every five years. Is it, is it accurate to say that they bloom on old wood then? No, they will blo bloom, ugh. they bloom on both old wood and new wood, but you want to prune them right after flowering because the most exuberant blooms are gonna be on those canes that, or that growth that overwinters. You're gonna have the buds form still in those terminal buds, and those are gonna be the first ones to bloom. And when, like when you hear Endless Summer, I have a friend in Alabama who wrote a scathing editorial about Endless Summer and how disappointing it was. And he's in Alabama, you know, it's a cool day in Alabama is 100 degrees <laughs> in the summer. And, and yes, I had, I had the endless summer growing in a horrible location, competing with a white pine tree for water and nutrients and sun. And it kind of sort of took a break during midsummer, it didn't bloom as much. But in October, it just really burst right into bloom. So if you can keep these things watered and fed, they will really keep blooming through the season. But that first shot of bloom from those overwintering buds is going to be the most spectacular. So you don't want to cut those off. One more. One more. Um, Hydrangeas and magnolias don't like a lot of fertilizer. Actually, you can kill a magnolia pretty effectively by fertilizing it too much because it has these ropey roots and very dependent on mycorrhizae. You will kill the mycorrhizae and the roots with too much fertilizer. Um, hydrangeas can take a bit, but they don't need a lot unless they're in a container, like if you're gonna grow a bloomstruck in a container to keep it going, you will need to give it liquid feed like any other container deck plant. Okay, thank you.